When you grow up in Florida, the first question a person might ask you is, do you go to the beach every day? This may be a reality for most of my peers in high school, but for myself, I hated the beach. I hate the drive over the bridge, I hate the amount of people there, and most importantly, I hated taking off my shirt. I hated the feeling of showing my body to the world. I was, for a lack of a better word, in how I truly felt fat. I couldn't take off my shirt to save my life, because deep down, I knew that wasn't who I wanted to be. This simple journey to the beach and the internal thoughts of self-doubt were the start to my journey dealing with bulimia. To introduce myself, my name is William Cabaz. I'm a first-generation gay Lebanese student here at Syracuse University studying public relations with a minor in art history. Life hasn't always been the easiest for a person with as many adjectives as myself. I can only say the reason I'm standing here today is because of the struggle and the fight a person like myself has to overcome. So let's start with the first time I ever took the leap of faith to change my life. I was on a class trip to Orlando with my newspaper staff as we were attending the Florida Scholastic Press Association Spring Convention. My entire staff had taken a trip to the nearest hibachi restaurant before we attended a dance held for students to meet each other. I was chubby, overweight, and you know damn well enjoying that hibachi dinner. <laughs> As we left, I knew I had overeaten. I could feel my belly twisting and turning. Luckily for myself, I was only rooming with a close friend at the time. He stepped out of the hotel room to go to the dance and I yelled out to him, I'll be there in a second. At that moment, I knew I was making a decision, one that I didn't know would affect my life for the next five years. I proceeded to throw up that entire meal collect myself, and walk straight down to that dance floor. It was the first time I felt okay, but only because I skipped a meal. Bulimia and anorexia are the two most commonly diagnosed eating disorders within the LGBT community. Bulimia is the purging of large quantities of food, and anorexia is a fear, an unwarranted fear, of being overweight, which leads to obsessive exercise and starvation. A professor in children's health and eating disorders at the University of California School of Medicine, Dr. Daniel Lee Grange, has, has discovered that at least 30 million people of all ages and genders suffer from an eating disorder in the United States, with gay men being the most susceptible. According to the NEDA, a study conducted by Florida State University psychology professor, Dr. Pamela Keel, around 42% of gay men in the United States are diagnosed with an eating disorder at some point in their lives. For myself, that diagnosis came a lot sooner than most. That initial moment of relief I had on this class trip was a rush I wasn't willing to let go of. I proceeded to lose over 90 pounds within the, first, within the course of the first year. I pretended to be on a forced diet to hide from parents, friends, and teachers. At my lowest, I was 125 pounds. I was a 5'11 male with very little muscle and a fixation on being the skinniest person in the room. It was a goal not only for myself, but for the ability to attract other men. The nature of gay culture highly emphasizes physical appearance, which often leads men to feel pressured into conforming to stereotypes. The social cultural norms that advance the notion of an ideal body image, unattainable by many, influence attitudes toward eating. The American School Counselor Association describes the ideal body image for males as strong, muscular, lean, with perfect figures. The struggle with body image has caused many gay men to harbor an internal negative perception of themselves, their food, and their current way of life. This perfectly describes the way I felt. As a young gay male in Southwest Florida, my high school was predominantly filled with white straight folk with no sense of the word gay. I was unfortunately outed as an eighth grader to my entire class. I remember that day like it was yesterday. A classmate of mine took my paper and just wrote the word gay on the top of my sheet and showed it to the class. I immediately had a moment of fear. It was like my world had collapsed. But in that moment, I chose to be me, and I never looked back. I left that class with a smile from ear to ear, walked straight into the locker pod, and screamed, I like dick! And that was the end of it. But they just never understood me. They didn't know what it truly meant to live in a world that only looks down on you. I had no one to connect to, but there was a temporary solution that I thought could fix this. Grinder. As a 16-year-old boy joining an application made for 18-plus adults to meet each other and have sex, I was diving into uncharted territory, illegal territory, some might say. But to be honest, I was happy. 
I found the people who enjoyed the attraction of other men, and for me, that was priceless. I noticed that every time I posted a new picture or lost more weight, I received more and more attention. This drove me insane. I went from being an overweight, chubby virgin to having sex with men twice, even three times my age. But for what? My own self-validation? It led me down to a path of regret and further induced my love for not keeping my food down. It took two years for my mom to ever notice. My mother is the most proud Lebanese woman on this planet. She wakes up at 6 a.m. to start cooking a four-course meal for her children every day. The minute I'd come home from school, there would be a massive table of all the most desirable foods in front of me. As an Arab, one of the most disrespectful things a person can do is to not eat their mother's cooking. It was like a slap to the face. So I ate and ate and ate, but after every time, I'd go to the bathroom immediately right after. It was on my 18th birthday. I ate my piece of cake, said my thank yous, and expected to just throw it up and move on with my life. But thankfully, my mother heard me from the hallway. She screamed, she cried, but she was helpful. I always did consider my mother to be a selfish, sometimes an ignorant woman at times, but in the moment, I knew she could hear the screams coming from my stomach. She could sense the pain that my body had endured. Since that moment, I knew I needed to get help. Over the last four years, I've gone to nutritionists in Florida, to therapists, and to anyone who could help remotely try to help my self-confidence. But deep down, just like my mother, I'm also very selfish. I chose to ignore a lot of what people had told me because I knew if I gained even one more pound, my life would be over. There's always a turning point in everyone's life that really shows perspective and a path for them to follow. And for me, this was my father's death. I never told my father of my eating disorder, and to this day, that haunts me. My father was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer my sophomore year of high school. But only after, only after my parents' divorce, only a year later, I never really communicated with him. I figured that with him out of my life, things would just be easier, as we didn't have a great relationship. Two years roll by, and I receive a call. It's him. He lived in the town only 30 minutes north of us alone. Hi, Baba, how are you? In English, my father goes, I need you to take me to the hospital. I can't move and I'm running a fever. I quickly got in my Mini Cooper, drove to his apartment. I opened the front door to him, just laying on his couch, shirtless, with a rag over his head. I had not seen my dad in over a year at this point, but what I saw is still ingrained in my head to this day. He had lost so much weight from the chemotherapy and just his overall health that he was the same size as me. His body was identical to my own. At that moment, I knew I needed to stop. I needed to take control of my life before it caught up to me. After taking him to the hospital, my father eventually lost his battle to cancer only three days later. Death is something I had never thought of before. But when you feel good, when you feel so good doing something your head is telling you is fine, death is the last thing you can even think about. The image of my father's body will never go away but the love I have for myself will, and that's okay. I believe that life is about understanding that you'll never be perfect. You'll never have the dream life that you always think about. A quote I live by every single day, said by the legendary RuPaul's Charles, RuPaul Charles is if you can't love yourself, how in the hell are you gonna love somebody else? Fast forward to being in college. Yeah, do I struggle with my eating habits? Of course. It's never going to be something I can just wake up and fix. It's been a long battle that seems to just never end. But the moments of peace I have when I look in the mirror is something I just never will take for granted. I'm happy looking at myself, knowing that there was once a time I hated what I saw. Because if you can't recognize the problems you ha once had, you'll never be able to get over them later. I've truly found a moment in life where it feels right. I haven't had a romantic partner in over two years, not because I hate my body, but because I know I need a man who will love it just as much as I do. I need to find people who love me for me, and that led me to the biggest gay red flag in the whole world, a fraternity. Uh, <laughs> I am currently the vice president of external affairs for Phi Kappa Theta, a group of men dedicated to just a simple concept, brotherhood. We hang out every day, we grab dinner together, we study together. They're my life. 
I truly feel like I found my chosen family. They look at me as an equal and now as one of their leaders. They support my goals and encourage me to fight for what I believe in. But in ways, I feel this part of my heart just empty, yearning for the gay life I'd always dreamt of. I want to be in a room with only gay men experiencing everything that life has to offer. But that just isn't my reality. I've had to learn that for myself, I'm a force to be reckoned with. And if I just stick true to my heart and the things I believe in, I will gain all the happiness in the world, even if it's with a bunch of straight guys. The main takeaway I want this audience to get from my talk is that life is interesting. It's a game of monopoly. Some are playing and some are just watching. Take a moment to realize that no one can change who you are and what you believe in, but there will be moments that will bring you so far down in life and the people closest to you are there to help. If my mother was somewhere else in my house on the day of my 18th birthday, I could possibly not be here today. And for that, I am grateful. Life will never be a linear ladder for one just to climb. I'm a gay, Arab, first-generation frat boy, recovering ED patient, and the list goes on, and so does my heart. So I will passionately wear those identities on my sleeve and wave to the people that support me. The struggle for gay men is severe, and struggling with an eating disorder is hard, but it should not be a lifelong ailment. It is important to seek assistance. For anyone struggling with an eating disorder, the NEDA's website offers a support via its helpline, online, its, its helpline and online chat-to-chat -chat, and an emergency text line that is open from Monday to Thursday. Thank you.